Good morning and welcome to today's Fridays with Vistage webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over some items to help you participate in today's webinar. If you are experiencing technical difficulties joining the webinar session, please call Citrix support at 888-259-8414. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. To submit a written question at any time during the event, type your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the control panel and, send, and click send. I would now like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Dave Nelson. Welcome members and guests to the Fridays with Vistage webinar. I'm Dave Nelson, a 14-year Vistage member, CE676 in Pittsburgh, and your webinar host. Today, we're talking about the new multi-generational workforce. Our guest today is Jill Silman Chapman, Senior Performance Consultant with Insperity Recruiting Services. Hey, Jill, welcome to the webinar. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Let me give a quick introduction. Jill is a, she's developed a variety of business ventures in the workforce industry, partnering with clients to recruit and train, recruit and train staff with an emphasis on productivity and performance, something we all need. At Insperity Recruiting Services, Jill helps businesses, particularly vistage size companies, small and medium-sized firms, find the best talent with the latest in recruitment strategy, talent attraction methods, and technology. Jill is committed to changing lives by connecting the right talent to the right company so that everyone succeeds. If you have questions today, we're gonna to take them at the end, but type them when they occur in the GoToWebinar Q&A box, and we'll answer as many as we can. So Jill, let's get rolling. Tell us about the new multi-generational workforce. Fantastic. Well, here we go. You know, no matter what your job or your industry, no matter what your generation, actually, congratulations. You're part of the biggest demographic shift the workplace has ever seen. Here's a few factoids for you. At this moment, millennials outnumber boomers in the workplace. Did you know that? The margin's slim. It's only about 3%, but it's growing rapidly. And right now, what we see most is that we have three generations, the baby boomers, Generation X, and those millennials or, or Generation Y vying for influence without real consensus on work ethic or efficiency. And here's another fact for you. Age and experience no longer indicate the role. One in three employees reports to someone younger. One in seven reports to someone a full decade younger. And then there's this whole new generation, Generation Z, perhaps you've heard about them. Um, they're entering the workforce at a rate of four and a half million each year. So in this dynamic setting, how do we actually relate with each other? Which generations work well and which ones are conflict prone? And how do these shifts impact you in particular? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get going, let's put it in perspective, because sometimes people say, why do we have to talk about this? Why do we care about this? Well, generational conflict, it has a cost. To get an idea of what's happening to your bottom line when the generations don't work together well, you can put numbers on the following costs. When we're talking about hard costs like turnover, the cost of losing an employee due to generational conflict, it may vary based on the, the level of the individual, the individuals within your workforce, but there's a dollar amount associated with the cost of hiring, processing, and training every new employee. So determine your loss on an employee who's been with you for a year. Multiply the employee salary by 1.4, and that's the investment that you have in that employee. If the person's been with you two years or more, multiply by a solid two. And it's not just about turnover, but, you know, what about absenteeism? How often do employees take unscheduled personal days or sick days to avoid conflict? Look at the teams with high conflict levels and compare their absenteeism rates with those well-run teams. What's the difference? How much of the conflict is generational? You can put a number on those days and, and multiply by the employee compensation to figure that out. And then we have wasted time, right? On average, employees spend about two, almost three hours each week avoiding conflict. That's 17 days a year. And if that conflict's generational, you can measure those hours and multiply by compensation costs to calculate your loss. What about re reduced productivity? When multiple generations aren't communicating well when they're working on a project, the roles get confused, the jobs take longer, and quality fails. How can you measure how output, speed, or quality has fallen during a period of generational conflict? 
In one study, 10% of employees reported project failures due to team conflicts. If the conflict's generational, it's measurable money down the drain, right? And then, of course, we have legal costs. If a lawsuit's filed by an employee, you spend money on the legal fees and the wages for all the employees who are addressing the court case. If a client files because of a missed project deadline, those legal fees and fines rob you of money that could have gone toward productivity, innovation, or new sales. And then we have the soft costs. On the, soft, uh, on the surface, really, soft costs, they may not be measurable or, or easily assigned a, a specific dollar amount, but they still affect your bottom line. It might include the loss of corporate knowledge and know-how, diminished innovation and problem-solving ability, morale is affected when existing employees have to do more, more work when others leave or don't do their share due to the generational differences, decreased customer service, damage to your company reputation, and lost opportunities also drain money from the organization. So this is real stuff that we're talking about. Before we move forward, I, I, I just want to help everybody to understand when I refer to the different generations, who's who, right? Well, we have um, the oldest group that's still in the workforce. I sometimes say there could be the CEO of the organization, or it might be that person that handed you the cart at the Walmart last night. Um, but this generation I refer to as traditionalists or matures, typically born before 1946. And then we have the group of baby boomers that were about uh, 1946, 1965. That's the typical accepted range for that particular generation. Gen X, small in numbers and also small in the um, uh, beginning and end dates, if you will, the brackets for this particular generation, born mostly in the 70s, um, 65 to about 1980 is the, the typical wisdom there. And then we have Generation Y. You can see on my slide that I wrote it Y, as in why do I have to do it that way? But you'll also hear this generation referred to as Generation Y, the letter that follows X, um, and also the Millennials. They were born mostly in the 80s and into about the mid-90s. Around 95 or so, we saw the introduction of the, um, the most recent generation that's um, entering our workforce, and that generation is known as Generation Z. So how did they decide who's a baby boomer and who's a Gen Z? Well, what uh, the, the science behind this is that they take a look at common experiences when someone is coming of age, that 8 to 13-year-old time frame typically, um, they look at a, a, a big moment in time, that kind of moment that you could describe in vivid detail. You know where you were, what you were doing, what mom was cooking on the stove, whatever. Um, but those common experiences when you're coming of age, and they look in front and behind that, looking for shared values, a, a value system that they can assign to a particular group of people, a, a particular cohort. So that's how they know I'm a baby boomer and you may be a Gen X, for example. Well, why is that important? Because of the, the fact that all of this discovery is based on values, right, looking for the shared values of a group of people, well, our values are the foundations of our beliefs. And our beliefs fuel our behaviors, and it's those behaviors that come to work, right? Um, so to put this in some frame, it, it, it's important for us to talk about. Before I move forward and talk about oh, where do those conflicts show up at work or, or you know, what's important to each generation, well, let's try to define the generations if we can um, for just a few moments. So when I talk about the traditionalists, um, this is a group, you know, you may have heard them referred to as the silent generation, but it's a group that still has faith in the nation's institutions. Um, they had faith in their employer. They had faith in the government. They had faith in everything, and they had a real sense of duty, um, a duty to wherever they, they pledged their allegiance, their country, their um, their church, their, their workplaces, but they have great faith. They were, they were brought up to have great faith in all of these different institutions and it made them very loyal, loyal employees, loyal customers. If you know people out of this age group, um, out of this cohort group, they're, they're, they may even still refer to the fact that they trade with a certain brand or they trade at a certain um, retailer. Um, my, my father uh, falls into this category. Um, and um, so the make and model of the car, Pretty much 
make a model of the car and the truck. They stay the same. It's just maybe a, a newer model um, of, of, or a newer version of that same model, I guess, um, because that's what they know. That's what uh, they believe in. I'm pretty sure that my parents know that there are other people who make washers and dryers, but because I guess their first washer and dryer when they were starting out was a Maytag. That's all they ever talk about. That's all they ever look for. If it's, if it's time to replace the old washer and dryer, we're going back and buying another Maytag. They're that kind of loyal. These are the folks that worked for the gold watch at the end of their um, at their at the end of their careers. Also, very heavily influenced by the military. Of course, this is a group that was very um, in, you know clearly impacted by World War II, and so uh, the way that they ran their businesses, the way that they uh, uh, participated in school. It's just work before play, right? Duty before pleasure. That's the kind of work ethic. You want to drive somebody crazy out of this generation, go stand by the water cooler and, and laugh a lot um, because I'm, I'm sure they'll pace right in front of you looking at their, their watch saying, hey, hey, we have work to be done. We don't do that until um, after we're done with our project or after we're done with, the, with our assignment. It's also a group that um, as, a, as a generation is very patient because they had to wait for things. They didn't have credit like we have credit today. Um, yeah, they might have had you know, credit with the, um, with the grocer or something like that, but grocers all knew when the paychecks were coming in, and so they knew when the, they, they expected to be paid. So this is a group that if they wanted something, they had to save for it, right? Um, and they, they grew very patient, waiting for the day that they could buy something or do something. It wasn't just um, instantaneous as it is today. Again, with the, the uh, uh, influence of the military, and the, they pretty much rule followers. That command and control. I'll tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. Um, again, very, very um, much impacted, I guess, if you will, by um, uh, by the military. This is also a generation that demands quality. If we were live and I could hear your responses, I bet I could say, it's junk unless it's made in the USA, right? Um, this is a, a group that demands quality. They're not going to have a lot of anything, but what they have is probably the best that they can afford. Um, and with this group, standard options are fine. You know that car that sits in my dad's driveway? He goes and buys a car off the lot. He's not asking for a custom color or video uh, video monitors in the headrest or anything like that, standard options are fine. If you know people out of this generation, there's a, a good chance that they could afford much more than uh, their their current living accommodations in, in many cases. But you know what? What they have is just fine for them. Keeps a roof over their head, they keeps them dry, warm, cold, whatever they need. Um, standard options are absolutely fine. I always make a joke about my dad. And that if he could still roll up his windows in his car, he absolutely would because he has a screwdriver and he knows how to make that work. Um, you start getting into all the the uh, computer chips and all that sort of thing in the in the new automobiles, and he can't fix that, right? So standard options with this generation are absolutely fine. Here's a a fun little quiz for you, a, a fun poll. So if we can um, start the poll, what's the first thing your generation wanted to buy? Do you remember? Uh, when you would think about saving up, what was the first thing that you wanted to buy? And there's no right or wrong answer, um, but uh, let, let us know what you thought. Was it a home, a car, a company, a personal computer? And I'll uh, just comment to folks that uh, you should see that poll on your screen with the four choices Jill, Jill just highlighted. And um, Jill, I'll ask you to slow down just a little bit. There's okay. so much content coming here that we'll be able to digest it a little bit better. Great. Okay. Fantastic. I think we can go ahead and, and stop that polling question and move on to the next one. Birthday parties in your generation, were they only for rich people? Or the day that you got to pick what meal and cake you wanted? Or was it up to you to come up with a cool new theme each year for your birthday party? Did you have a jumping castle, a, a DJ, a caterer? Was it an all-out all out party? Anybody mortgage a home for your 16th birthday party? Do you think and we could stop like, and? Yeah, let's. I mean, let's just comment on the let's, results here. It looks yeah, like let's most look at people, the results. Yeah, I was buying a car, by the way, and it looks like that's what most people were doing. And um, interesting answer here on the uh, on right, the right birthday party. 
as we move through the the presentation, we'll have a few more of these, but uh, um, that gives me a real good insight as to who we're all talking about and who we're all talking to. So I think you guys will have a lot of fun um, as we talk about the baby boomers. Um, for a long time, remain the largest generation in the workforce, but as I mentioned to you earlier in the presentation, um, uh, we're, we've been superseded by the millennial generation. Uh, they're, they've outpaced us by less than 5% right now, but, uh, but they've kind of knocked us off that pedestal. Well, and I keep saying us because I'm clearly a baby boomer, my own self. Um, as a group, we're a very motivated, optimistic group of folks um, because when we were coming up, we were told we could be anything that we wanted to be, and we believed that. Also very, very competitive because out of our generation, there was only one person that got their paper up on the board. There was only one valedictorian of our classes. And there was only one person at the end of a sports season that got a trophy, and that was the most valuable player, right? You didn't get a ribbon just for showing up. So we've remained very, very competitive. Um, you know, when I talk about being motivated and optimistic, <clears throat> It's in a different way than the younger generations, perhaps. Uh, a classic example is the fact that my parents might have asked me, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would have told them, and they would have said, hey, that's a great goal. That's really cool. That's interesting. And turned around and walked out of the room. Today, if I asked my child, well, hey, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? And if he gave the same answer that I gave, um, I'd be saying, okay, well, let's take, let's take you down to the political headquarters. I'll get you in uh, speech and debate classes. We'll buy some striped ties, uh, you know, all this sort of thing to get him ready for, um, for what he's trying to pursue in the future. Um, but uh, but it, it's still that same level of perhaps uh, uh, optimism or motivation because Clearly, they're our kids, right? Um, for baby boomers, we created that sense of, of personal development, and that's of utmost importance to our uh, our cohort group. Um, probably driven by that competitive nature, if you have those letters behind your name on your business card, I need an extra set. Um, so we created this need for an MBA. We created this need for certifications uh, because we needed those things that 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 could tell the world that we are actively involved in, in growing as individuals, growing in our professions, growing personally. We can make an icon out of anybody, Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil, Dr. whoever, um, because that we want to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. Anybody do performance reviews at your offices? Well, you have baby boomers to thank for those, right? Um, we're the reasons that you have to go through all of that um, uh, minutia once a year. And, and, you know, now it's usually online, so people can't put the file in their desk drawer and look at it again next year. Um, they have to put it in some file on the computer. But, um, but, but performance reviews and performance management was largely an outgrowth of uh, the baby boomers' uh, impact on the workforce. We've been pretty much defined by our job and, and our achievements. Quite frankly, um, I, I, I think a lot of us are learning that we can't keep all the plates spinning and spinning well at the same time. And so if in looking backwards, we can see that, that some of us, um, maybe one of the plates did fall to the ground. It was very difficult to be the best spouse, the best parent, the best employee, the best boss, the best this, the best that, all at the same time. And so we might have lost on a couple of fronts. And so we, we really poured into our careers and into our achievements because that was something vis visible that said we're still a success, right? So very much defined by our job and our achievements. I, also, I often tease, if you walk into a baby boomer's office, you know you're in a baby boomer's office because they have at least one me wall every trophy, every plaque, every certificate, every everything that they've been given is up on the wall so that they can um, share with everyone um, their achievements that they've uh, collected over their career. Do you know that the word workaholics didn't even exist until the baby boomer generation hit the, um, hit the scene? Because for us, it's really about the number of hours that we work. Our, our definition of working hard is perhaps not working, you know, every minute of every day, but it's how many minutes in a day that, w that we work. And it's killing us when everybody is moving to this, um, you know, virtual work environment because you don't know how long we're working. 
So typically we're the ones that are writing those emails at two o'clock in the morning and, and of course somewhere in the body of that email we're gonna point out to you, Yeah, it's two o'clock. I just you know wanted to get this taken care of. I, you know, I just wanted you to know how dedicated I am to um to my job. Probably it's a little bit because of that competitive nature, right? Because if I see you working until 5.30, well, I'm a better employee than you are, so I have to work until 6, and 6 becomes 7, becomes 8. Then we're asking for a couch, you know, with a pullout um, in our office, or um, would it be trouble to install a shower, um, you know, in, in the corner? Um, just because we need you to know that we're working very, very hard. And again, kind of that, that whole idea of we need those things that indicate that we're successful because there may be a part of ourselves that was less than successful. We might have lost a marriage. We might have lost some relationships. Um, we might have done some things that um, that uh, that we weren't um, as great at. So um, so we had to have other things that that filled that void, filled that gap. We're the reason that you buy shirts to tell how much you paid for your shirt because of the logo on there or, you know, how much your purse cost. We're the we're the group that made hood ornaments such a big deal on cars. Right. Um, matter of fact, there was a I want to say it was either Suzuki or Subaru back in the day. Somebody had a commercial and and speaking right to the baby boomers because the, the commercial, the gist of the commercial was your hood ornament is so that you can find your car, not yourself, right? Um, but that was something that, you know, that's something that we've used to, to be able to indicate the level of our success. And as a generation, we're one of the last to really embrace technology. For us, it brings almost as many problems as it does solutions. Um, you know, I'm still convinced that a, a lot of what I do in my daily work, if I could just file it in a file drawer, I could find it very, very quickly. But I can't remember what I named it. I can't remember which file I put it in, which drive did I store it on. Um, you know, there's a lot of times that I'd just as soon throw my computer out the window if I could get a, a window that opened, right? Hey, what was your favorite childhood drink? Um, let's open up the poll again and let's and let's take a look. Was it Coca-Cola? Was it Kool-Aid? How about anything diet or Starbucks? We've probably given everybody enough time. Let's move to the next polling question. When you grew up, what did you want to be? Did you want to be a doctor, the president, an entrepreneur? How about a celebrity? Great. I'm sure you had enough time with that. Let's move on. So let's talk a little bit about Generation X. Now, when um, when I started our presentation, I said that as a generational cohort group, this one's rather small. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I wish I could be with you uh, where we could interact because I'd like to know why you think it's such a small generation. But I'll tell you, it's the first generation you could take a pill not to have. And if you fall in this generational cohort group, I'm not saying your parents didn't love you. Um, but but in many cases, the parents were the, the baby boomers, the oldest of that generation, uh, largely, or perhaps some traditionalists. But um, it, it was a group that was very involved in their career, very involved in, you know, seeing what they could um, what they could get out of life. And I wasn't going to step off the fast track. Are you going to? No. So nobody has the time or the energy um, necessarily to um, um, to have borne uh, a much larger generation. A couple other things about this generation, too. Came in an age when the U.S. was losing on a few fronts or appeared to be losing. So everything we were teaching this generation to put their value and their trust in just wasn't holding water, right? Couldn't believe in the economy um, as mom and dad were getting laid off from their jobs, couldn't believe in Vietnam, um, uh, couldn't believe in the military because of Vietnam, couldn't believe in the government because of Watergate. Um, and even from a, a perspective, a, a large perspective, we were thinking, oh, no, America's losing out to to the Japanese from a, a standpoint of, of industry and, um, and expansion. So we created a generation that's somewhat cynical, somewhat pessimistic, somewhat not wanting to get too involved in things, right? But we also created a very self-reliant um, um, generation because this is the first generation of what we would call latchkey kids, first generation that um, 
that came home, let themselves off, you know, got themselves off the bus, came home, made their own snack, did whatever they did until mom and dad got home from um, uh, from work. And so for that reason, this is a generation that really values control because they've had a lot of control from a very early age. You know, we might have told them, take out the garbage cans, uh, make your bed, do some chores. And they would have done those chores. But you know what? They got to pick what time they did those chores. They got off the bus at 3.30. Mom and dad didn't get home till 6. So if they were running behind the house and putting the garbage cans away at, at 6.25 or 5.55 or whatever, that was up to them. So they had some control about how that worked, how those chores got done. And because they had slightly absentee parents, right, um, they learned how to do things on their own and definitely don't want to be micromanaged. <clears throat> they didn't need mom and dad at home. They don't need them at work, right? This is a generation that grew up with Pong, right? You remember that? Um, and, and so they grew up playing with technology and had technology introduced into their classroom. So technologically, they're very, very savvy. You want to upset this group? Let your internet go down. Let your um, let your uh, email not work for a couple of days. Um, Here's, and here's something really, really different between Generation X and those generations that came before. They respect production over tenure. This is the group that came to work and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't care that I've been here three weeks and you've been here three years. We're doing the exact same job. Why, why are we not making the same amount of money? And by the way, why are you still doing this job three years later, right? Like, you can find another job. Um, so uh, the very first group to bring in this uh, opinion that was counter to the way that we thought about seniority, right? Paying our dues and that sort of thing. This group was all about, if I'm doing the same thing, I expect the same wages. And began to look at a job as kind of a, a, a gig, right? They, they have much more of a free agent mentality. I'll do this as long as everybody's keeping up they're part of the contract, right? If I say I'm going to do this, this is my deliverable to you, and you deliver back to me, we're all good. Um, but the day that one side, one party lets the other one down, we're out of here, right? Um, and and <clears throat> possibly this was because they saw that their parents were laid off or folks that they knew were laid off. So why would I give and give and give? if I couldn't expect that my employer was going to give back in the same in the same vein. Got another polling question coming up for you. So if you got in trouble, what would your mom do? Can we start that poll? Great. So would your mom spank you? Would she say, wait until your father gets home? Would you go into timeout or would she just ignore you until she found a solution in a self help book? I think we've had enough time with that one. Let's move ahead. So what was the worst fashion mistake of your generation? Let's open this poll. Was it double knit, bell bottoms, bangs that went all the way to Mars, or baggy low riding pants? And Mars as in Mars the planet. When we shut this one down, let's look at the results. Let's just see where we're at. <laughs> Great. We're still riding uh, pretty true to form with the with the group of, of folks here. So that's fantastic. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Fantastic. So whoops, moved on a little too much. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes about that Generation Y. Um, again, very optimistic group of, of, uh, of people, um, largely because their parents heavily influenced their lives and their parents were very optimistic group of people, right? Baby boomers. Um, but again, slightly different tact. When we thought we were motivated and, and optimistic about things and our parents would say, hey, you got some goals, go for them, do it. Well, here, we're more inclined to say, hey, you've got some goals, let me help you get there um, and, and take a very active role in, in their optimism or, or helping them to, to meet their goal. It's also a generation that grew up very, very busy. Grew up with day timers and organizers or day planners or whatever you want to call them in elementary school. They didn't just open the back door, or run out the back door to go play. No, we had play dates scheduled for this group, right? And right after the play date, we were going to go to trumpet lessons. And then after that, we'll go to ballet. And then after that, we're going to go to um, baseball practice or, or whatever. So very, very highly scheduled um, generation. 
This is also a generation that grew up talking, talking a lot about everything. You know, mama would say, hey, you know, let, let's talk about things. Before you make big decisions, let's just talk about them, okay? Before you make this decision or that decision, let's just talk for a few minutes. And by the way, um, we're going to put you on this prescription. And so when you get to school, I need you to tell your teacher about this. I need you to tell the nurse about this. So you're on this ADD medicine, but, and it's okay. It's truly okay, but let's just tell people about this. There's a, a fantastic story from this particular cohort group that was in my own um uh, my own experience. And uh, one day I was walking down the hall of my office and I had some staff that were <clears throat> kind of in a bullpen area, if you will. And at one point, um, uh, uh, one of my employees slammed her hand down on the desk and said, ah, I forgot my Prozac again today. Well, my jaw hit the floor and I stopped dead in my tracks going, oh my goodness, I would never want my supervisors to know that I needed drugs to get through a day. Um, but but for her, that was no big deal. Aren't, isn't everybody on Prozac? Like, you're not on that? That's weird because I thought almost everybody was. But they, um, they lack that discretion because we've had them sharing um, for so long. And sharing on social media just exacerbates that, right? They tell you what they had for dinner. They tell you where they're going, they tell you who, who they're with, and what they're thinking. Um, so uh, a generation that, that likes to share a lot. And sometimes in earlier generations' viewpoints, lack a little discretion. This is also a generation that communicates with text or IMing uh, is something that you might see at your office. Um, so very quick uh, responses back and forth, but um, but relying on text, not emails, not phone calls, but text um, to communicate with each other. Very collaborative. This probably grew out of their experiences in school um, in that um, they were they worked on teams, right? Um, teams for everything. I, I know when my son came home from from school, I, I knew somebody in his class could add two plus two. I wasn't sure it was him, um, but he would very often bring these papers home that had DIT written on the top of it, which meant done in team. Um, so with the, that collaborative, uh, you know, getting everybody's input and everybody's ideas before moving forward. This is a generation that has a real drive to be discovered, um, to be recognized. Um, uh, you know, you, you've probably read uh, news stories about, uh, you know, what links some of these folks will go to to get likes on their on their social media posts, for example, um, but really want to be discovered a la Kim Kardashian, um, not necessarily for having any great skill or or um, or uh, experience, but um, just for their opinion or, or um, uh, for their celebrity. And as a group, it's a group that wants to make an impact. Now, I'm not saying that the generations that came before didn't also have this sort of a, an idea, but, but it has become uh, very much part of their, um, their DNA with this particular generation. Now, I think what they think uh, is having an impact, whether it's, well, I clicked on that website and it donated, you know, rice to somebody or I bought these shoes and that took care of some other kids and, and that sort of thing. But uh, but having an impact is, is going to be important to this particular generation. Um, and, and we see that start to show up at work. Let's quickly look at another one of our, um, our polls here. So, whoops, brothers and sisters in your generation, what was that like? Did they play with you? Help you do your chores? Were they fun until you became a teen? You only see them about once a year because you're so busy. And which brothers and sisters are you talking about? My step ones or my real ones? Let's take a look at those results. Ah, okay. So maybe I can get a little better picture of um, what which group within a cohort group that we might be talking about. You know, when we when we paint those broad brush strokes to say that. I'm a baby boomer and you're a Gen X. Um, those who fall on the cusp or the older parts of that, that uh, time period will sometimes take on some of the uh, generational uh, appearance of uh, the generation that came right before them. So interesting, interesting results. Let's move forward. Great. 
Let's talk just for a minute about Gen Z. Again, um, the earliest of those are coming into the workforce right now. They were born about 1994, 1995. Um, some of the research about this generation, you may, if you want to study them, you may also find that they're called Homelanders or the iGen. They may be Generational Edge or Globals uh, in some cases. You know, clearly it's still emerging, but all indications are showing us that they're a sturdy and re resourceful and, 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 and a generation that's really, really um, willing to work. Um, but um, when we think about this generation, you know, before you start jumping up and down for joy because <clears throat> we think that they're willing to work, you, we've got to consider a few things, right? Every generation has its strengths and has its weaknesses, and Gen Z's no exception. Um, you know, what are they going to mean for our offices? Um, we find that one of the things about this generation is that they seem to be more compliant. So let's think about that, though. If they're more compliant, does that mean they're just going to keep their heads down and, and, and just do their jobs without a greater sense of purpose or a sense of mission? And if they're compliant, are they going to be slightly indecisive, hesitate to take risks? Unlike their older brothers and sisters or cousins who communicate with text, this is a generation that communicates with images. So if they communicate with images, a GIF, a meme, a, uh, an, an emoji, um, are they going to communicate imprecisely? You know, I was thinking about this the other day, and I was just driving to work, and I had this thought, and I thought, um, it wasn't long ago that I was at a museum <clears throat> and I was reading some letters that were written in beautiful penmanship and just beautiful language and, and so emotive. And then I, you know, I think about my communications these days, quick little handwritten notes or or possibly um, an, an email. And then I think about the text and not using proper grammar, not using proper spelling. And then when we think about the youngest cohort group using emojis and, and gifts to communicate, are we not going back to the, the day of the hieroglyphics painted on the wall? I was like, oh, my goodness, how long did it take us to take a full circle um, before we're back to communicating like the cavemen? But um, but this is a group that, that tends to want to communicate with images. Um, they do though however like i said before expect to work for success and they are are very focused on the future they want to think about the future just very quickly i'll tell you because usually when i talk about this topic people want to say well how are they going to be very different than the millennials and i'll just give you a couple of insights you know how we talked about the millennials or the generation y being optimistic this group is going to be very realistic um they really do expect to have to work harder than the previous generations um you know millennials were optimistic largely i think because of their baby boomer parents and and they grew up in a time of prosperity and and opportunity but because Generation Z is born to, to more Generation X parents and they grew up in a recession, I think that they're going to be a little bit more um, realistic about having to, um, to work hard. They're also pushing back on that collaboration thought. They're much more independent. I think because a lot of the parenting said, you know, um, this is all cool that we have our kids involved in so many teams and so many things, but Maybe that was too much, and maybe we need to give this generation a little bit of a break. So they had more time to be on their own and do a little bit of self-discovery and that sort of thing. So um, I think that they're going to long for their own workspace and, and doing things on their own. Um, they're, they're very, very much a, a digital native generation, right? Um, there was, I read a survey one time that said 40% of this generation Working Wi-Fi was more important to them than a working bathroom, right? <laughs> um, so very, very interested in uh, uh, you know staying connected uh, and being part of the, the the digital age. Where their older brothers and sisters, those those Generation Wires, uh, clearly very digitally oriented, but they were digital pioneers. They can remember times when new new technology was unfolding. Uh, digital natives, of course you know, have grown up in an environment where social media was already pervasive. Um, and unlike the millennials, this is going to be a group that's a lot more private. I can watch my own son, who happens to be out of this this cohort group, uh, right on the cusp, actually. But 
he will not use Venmo. He will not use PayPal. He will not use some of these things. He's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't need people to know these things. Um, he's not all over the social media, uh, unless maybe it's a Snapchat or something like that. But, um, but uh, he's much more private about, you know, what he's doing. Um, and maybe because of the influence of their their baby boomer and and uh, even traditionalist grandparents, this is also a. a um, a generation that's beginning to long for more face-to-face -face time, um, and thankfully, uh, in in a lot of our opinions, I think. Here's something that's very, very interesting with this group: um, they're pushing back on formal education. They're much more interested in that on-demand learning. They're not seeing that going to college necessarily equates to getting a good job or having a real what they would call a true good education. Um, so on-demand learning is really what this generation is is all about. And I think where we've watched the millennials do a little bit of what we would call job hopping, this generation is probably going to be more likely to roll hop, staying with the same organization but trying to move around within that um, um, that organization. So just a little, a few fun facts. So for the, the, the rest of our time together, let's talk a little bit about what this looks like when it, it comes to work. Um, what are the things, where do we see the rubs in the different generations coming together? When we talk about career stages, future expectations for this, um, I think we still see career paths and, and our employers thinking in a, a, a linear motion, like we have to go up the ladder. Um, but I think with the younger generations that are coming into the work po workforce, we're going to see a desire for more lateral moves so that that ladder doesn't look like a ladder anymore, but maybe like a lattice, right? Um, and, and that there is the... Um, that it's a kind of spider web like in structure um, so that they can apply their knowledge and their skills to a variety of roles across either a variety of departments when you're within your organization or if they feel like they need to move out um, to get new experiences they will so if we can provide the opportunities a, a mechanism for you know kind of a, a web-based career progression it will keep our employees more proactively engaged in developing their careers with us, right? Um, you know, the traditionalists, they're all about building a legacy, so um, they're probably trying to wrap that up right now. Baby boomers, we're we're all about our careers, right? Um, um, but but I think that this is a, a cohort group that you're going to watch make the most changes. I, I think we've um, determined that we can't keep all the plates spinning, and so there there may be a general desire to to work less, leveraging our, our flexible work arrangements, or or moving into a different area of our business as we try to kind of limit um, uh, what we're doing so that we can move on to the next phase. But um, Xers, wires, they expect to have three completely different careers in their lifetimes. Um, I'm not talking about different jobs. I'm talking about different careers, being an accountant, then being a brain surgeon, and then being an interior designer um, like that. Um, and so um, um, because they understand this, there is a feeling that they might need to move, um, move to different organizations, even move to different industries or different sectors more quickly than those who, who came before them. You know, um, when I talk a lot about these different generations, the millennials, those Gen Yers, and boomers are surprisingly similar a lot of times, except around the ideas of technology. Very often, millennials are, will answer surveys just like a, a, a boomer. Um, matter of fact, they co-opt the boomer responses about 35% of the time. Um, they sometimes, uh, in, in, in some cases, will even choose boomer-centric answers more often than their own. Um, so, um, and, and as boomers, we're saying yes to their, their, their mindset, you know? We're kind of liking some of the things that, that, um, uh, that they might be bringing to the table. However, when technology comes into it, that's where you watch um, um, the breakdown between these, these different generations. Um, tech is where it might go wrong. The boomers, we just don't send a number of texts or we don't participate in social media like um, our younger cohort groups. Really, I think we could say it's defined around the way that we talk, right? For us as boomers, it's maybe face-to-face. -face. We'd love to be on the phone. We'd love to pick up the phone and talk to you. 
but email's good and text sometimes, but we don't think that that's talking, right? Um, if we've talked to you, we've, we've you know, been talking to you in person or on the phone, um, and we feel like we can get a lot more out of that level of communication. But when we talk to the millennials about um, about talking, they're like, yeah, okay, if the stakes are high face-to-face, -face, yeah, we can see how that's good. But but texting works really well most of the time, right? Email too, but, um, you know, if you want a face-to-face -face or a phone call with me about everything, I think you're micromanaging or, or you really don't know how to use technology, right? So how this shows up at work is it could create a lot of confusion, right? I'm trying to call you. You're not answering my uh, my voicemails or you're not picking up. Um, and so how on earth are we going to be able to communicate? And while I'm trying to leave you a voicemail, you're texting me. I'm not looking at my, my cell phone during the work day. Um, so how are we sending these messages uh, back and forth, uh, you know, uh, and some of the, the solutions might be that you just lay some groundwork that says, you know, if we're going to talk about mundane everyday things, yeah, I am me or send me an email. Um, but if you're not going to come to work, I want you to call me so I can hear you coughing and I want to hear how sick you really, really are. And by all means, if you're going to quit, you actually need to come in. We need to have that conversation face to face, right? When we talk about working hours and, and location, I think the conflict for this is really who owns our time? Um, I think the boomer answer says, during work hours, the company owns my time. Um, but the millennials and the generations under the boomers, they're going to say, you know, I'm really happy to work hard as long as I have a sense of owning my own time. I have to be on site, then I want as much say as possible over my hours because that whole idea of work hours is really slightly outdated, right? Because I can use my phone. Um, I can do so much from a distance to integrate work and life together. So, um, you know, what does this look like when it shows up? Well, maybe absenteeism, arriving late, leaving early, um, perhaps some turnover. Um, and then but really, I think this is where we're seeing kind of a sense of unfairness um, as some employees determine their schedules and others don't get that same opportunity. And then a, a level of disengagement with our workforce, um, um, you know, so so that it really does begin to affect productivity. Um, and, and so, you know, clearly. Work's got to be done. If we have a, a line, a staff that works a line, you know, they have to be staffed and we have to bill and uh, our, our clients, you know, and have record of our time. Projects have to be finished. I mean, it's not about what must be done. It's just how are we going to do it? And so every workplace is different, as is every industry. Um, but sometimes just small changes um, can give employees that sense of control over their time um, that they're looking for, and it can perhaps end some of that conflict there. And then um, when we talk about training and learning styles, well, everybody's got a little bit different um, preferred method uh, of, of learning. Um, if we're talking about the, the more traditionals, um, they, they want to participate in, in like lectures and expert presentations. They, they don't want things that could create an opportunity for them to be embarrassed. Um, <clears throat> you know, in front of a uh, in in front of a group. You know, this is a group that grew up listen and don't speak, right? Um, and and um, and so they they want to still participate in things, but but not in in situations that kind of put them out there. Um, you know, boomers, we've got a workaholic approach to learning. We'll do it anytime, any place, as long as it means that it's going to equate somehow to uh, achieving success for us. Um, again, we prefer the person in the front of the classroom, the teacher aspect. That's that's the way that we grew up. Um, we like a lot of storytelling and anecdotes, um, very, very important to us because TV was a big influencer and we can see some of that, um, uh, how that translates into our generation and the way that we like to receive um, information. Gen X, what do, you, what do you think about them? Of course, they, they want to learn by doing and they want to do a lot of self-directed learning, right? Individual research, individual projects. Um, if we're going to do, um, learning, formal learning, build in lots of activity, a field trip, a debate, role plays, games, um, using technology wherever possible. Gen Y, that 
they need a collaborative learning environment, a lot of peer interaction, they, and they like that reinforcement and reaffirmation um, as they move through their learning. They want fast moving, interactive activities, you know, short and sweet. Um, this is why we, we see a lot of the just-in-time um, access to learning bites, um, if you will. <clears throat> Also a generation that's very engaged by gaming or, or using some sort of a, a social media uh, platform to be able to, to uh, extend their learning. And when we talk about work and career, I think really what we're talking about is loyalty, right? Um, and loyalty means something different to each generation that comes before. If we're talking about boomers, you know, boomers want to be loyal to their company, to their team, and, and if their team and their company's loyal to them with a pay raise and a promotion every few years, it's golden. We're all good. This is the expectation. Millennials' answer is slightly different. They're loyal to quality of life and loyal to their own career. If I can see the next career step, the next level, the next skills that I might be able to learn, and if I know it's achievable fairly quickly, six months or so, you're going to earn my loyalty. Stall my forward movement and you're gonna lose my loyalty. So it shows up in shorter job tenures and turnover and um, you know younger employees who expect frequent promotions. Although I'm going to, to, to preface that by frequent promotions don't necessarily always mean upward, um, but to a new opportunity or to a new challenge. So let's say promoted to a new challenge is more likely. And when we're talking about job attractors, well, you can't look under the same rocks for all all the different cohort groups today. I think if you're particularly concerned with, with attracting the younger generations, if you're not connected daily um, to potential recruits through social media, you're probably missing out on some top talent, right? You need to be leveraging um, social media sites as, as ways to find those passive job seekers. Um, not only will they learn about your organization, you're going to learn a lot about them, right, from their social media profiles. Um, and, and, and it's going to be much more of a, a right cultural fit. They're going to identify much more. And you're going to be extending a brand um, out there in, in the public, too. So there's kind of a win-win there, right? Um, I, I think that um, um, it's really the importance of the brand that, that is most important. I think we spent a lot of time talking about, oh, everybody wants to, you know, see a, a company that is, um, you know, very involved in corporate social responsibility. And I think now that's really a given. And I think it is important to highlight, but I don't know that that's as attractive as just the overall mention of your entire employment brand. Um, and one other point that I'll make is that the youngest generations have a, a bit of wanderlust, I think, um, and so a very strong appetite for getting to work in other locales and other places or be other places while they're doing your work. So I think that that, if you can incorporate that, um, it's also a great um, a great motivator. Just real quickly, because um, I want to give you guys time for questions. I think when we think about um, the baby boomers, you know, think about trying to attract them with with mentions of it's the right thing to do. Um, that's how uh, that's how they see things. It's what's right? Individual recognition and give them vision for your organization. If you're talking about Gen X, all they care about is what's going to get the results, right? From a work-life balance perspective, that's very, very important to this generation. And bureaucracy is something that can drive them completely crazy. Our, um, our Gen Y, they're digital collaborators, right? So they want to do things toge together. They want leadership to be collaborative, too. They want their opinions to be heard. Um, they want to have information readily available. They want to have access to that information. And they want to have a voice in the decisions made. And we think that um, that our Gen Zers are going to be a group of people who are like, we can fix this. We can take everything that they've left us that's in turmoil and, and upside down, and we can fix that. We're looking for stability and clear role definement. So at the end of the day, really, nobody's wrong and nobody's right. We just all have different um, uh, you know, aspirations, and we see things slightly different because of the time that we grew up. So it's important for us to understand their, the, these compositions. Take what's good and try to get rid of the rest of it, right? So tap into that uniqueness and, and learn how to motivate. So with that, I'll ask if there's any quick questions um, that came in. 
uh, and I'll encourage people to um, click on the uh, go to webinar control panel. There's a little part where it says Q&A. Click the uh, triangle so it's pointed down and type us your question and uh, Jill will address it. Uh, by the way, Jill, I haven't thought about Kool-Aid in like 20 years, but that's <laughs> that's what I grew up on. It uh, seems to have been here. I, I remember the, the ubiquitous advertising when I was a child with, uh, with Kool-Aid. Right. Uh, so uh, I'll just times. let everybody know that if you if you answered those quiz questions mostly um, A's, um, which we didn't see a lot of that, that that usually falls to the more traditionalists uh, in our group. B's clearly baby boomers. C's Gen X and D's Gen Y. All right, that's that's a good key. So, um, uh, question that came in, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people. Uh, share the same frustration you can just hear it in the question mm -hmm. we are a manufacturer and on time on time prompt delivery is our value proposition ups shows up at the same time every day presumably for pickups <laughs> we need all generations to show up on time as the machining assembly and testing cannot be done from home via tablet or cell phone when employees feel like working how can this be communicated to younger generations? And I, I don't think it's just the communication. I think it's the motivation, too. So what would you say? Right, so? right. So I, I think there's a couple of things. We, we kind of hit on uh, hit a little bit on this a, a, a little earlier. But um, my, my quick answer is going to be explain the why. Now, clearly, if you're hired to be a UPS delivery person, you know your job is to deliver um, the packages. And so, uh, but, and they very much drill into those people, this is why it has to be on time. If it's not on time, you know, there's going to be extra expenses involved in that sort of thing. So I think uh, just as I described the millennial generation as Generation Y, I think being able to understand the relevancy of what they're doing to what goes on before and after their particular part in the equation is very, very important. So if they understand their role and understand how their role impacts other folks, I think that they go, uh, it goes a long way um, to, um, to building that engagement and, and understanding why it's so critical. Um, I would often think too that it has a little bit to do with when they are there, what kind of control do they have over their time? Now, you're going to ask them to be there at a certain time. That's great. But maybe there's other little places where you can give a little bit um, and, and make them feel, still feel like they have some control over, um, over their, um, you know, how they behave when they're there or when they can come and go on either end of those times or something like that. But but I think un understanding the why is most critical and then being able to uh, involve some small gains um, from a sense of control on uh, on that part uh, party's part is going to be very critical to keeping them engaged and keeping them um, focused on the tasks that must be performed, you know, in a timely manner or on site. Excellent. The question. Uh, yeah, yeah. And just uh, related. Um, and by the way, thanks, Meg, for chatting and Kool-Aid takes the heat off and puts the fire <laughs> on. Indeed. <laughs> All right. So last question, Jill, uh -huh. um, related. As a baby boomer, uh -huh. which many of our Vistage members are, what are some uh -huh. things that I need to learn or change to manage millennials? So what would be your closing advice on that? Yeah, I, I don't think that millennials really expect us to do a lot on their behalf. Like, I don't, ex I don't think that they expect us to really manage their careers or provide them with some sense of job security, but they do expect learning and development opportunities, right? Um, they want engaging work. They want some flexibility in how they work. Um, so if you can provide those sorts of things, um, you know, just learning more about them and, and what they need uh, is, is going to go a long way with that group. But I, d I don't think that they expect that we're going to completely change the way we do everything. But I do think that they expect us to step up with um, development opportunities and flexibility in how they work, where they work, and when they work, um, as well as keeping the work engaging, keeping them relevant um, to what's going on with the business. Excellent. Well, with that, we'll have to uh, wrap it up as we're at the top of the hour. Jill, thanks so much for joining us on the uh, Friday's webinar today. Hey, no problem. And you see my contact information. If you had questions that you didn't get a chance to, to share, I'm happy to answer those offline as well. Excellent. And for those who might be listening in the audio only domain in the future, uh, Jill.Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N at Insperity.com will get you there. 
So uh, also a reminder, you can always access and share past recordings of these Fridays with Vistage webinars and the slides at vistage.com forward slash webinars. And we've got three great webinars coming up in August. So on Friday the 4th, we're going to be talking about attracting and retaining talent, how benefits programs can provide a competitive edge. On Friday the 11th, we're going to talk about how to conduct a talent and culture gap analysis. And on Friday the 18th, we're going to talk about revving up your growth engine in the high gear. So with that, on behalf of Jill Silman Chapman and the entire team at Vistage Worldwide. I'm Dave Nelson. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you at the next webinar.